I'm Adam Green. I'm a professor of environmental studies here at Santa Barbara City College, and we're sitting on the campus right now in, in the beautiful Lifescape Garden. Um, I, we recently had the, the uh, good fortune of hosting Last Paradise, a film uh, that was produced and made by Clive Neeson, who has been doing this work for 45 years. And uh, it's a, one of the events of the Center for Sustainability and the Center for Sustainability is a program that actually started from student energy and was combined with uh, community involvement and really the desires of a, of a group of faculty and staff to uh, really make sustainability an, an integral part of the college itself. Um, one of the things that we do is, is actually try to find um, really motivate, motivating and innovative speakers to come to Santa Barbara to uh, interact with our students and interact with our community so that um, people can see what's going out going on in the rest of the world take something from it and hopefully then apply it back to to our own community here and uh, especially with students to apply it to their education and their career goals so in that regard Clive's film Last Paradise was was an excellent choice um, and uh, we were able to show it in, in the beautiful Arlington Theater uh, we had a great turnout, despite it being the middle of the week and, and rainy. Uh, we had nearly 700 people come um, from the community and a number of students. And uh, everyone that I've talked to that has seen the film has, I literally have a difficult time getting away from them after they've, they've spotted me because they want to speak so much about the film and how much uh, they enjoyed it. And um, it's everything from the the beautiful shots and the long, the, the long period of time that the film was uh, shot from, you know, really capturing multiple decades. Um, but also from the standpoint of students seeing that there's a, another way to interact with the environment that doesn't have to be um, just about what's the, the doom and the gloom, but also uh, we can look at it from the standpoint of really living in and interacting with the environment and, and actually taking something positive from it. So. That said, we're here with, with Clive to, to talk a little bit more about, about the film, about the science, about um, it's the, the possibilities of the film and how it is already affecting people, but also some ideas on how it might continue to do so. Um, so I think probably the, the first question I would just have is, is you started filming this at the age of 17 and, and you said that really at that point you actually had a pretty good idea that this was going to be something long long term that you were going to be filming this over a number of years and so why don't you just say a little bit about like your your process in doing that and making that commitment in in that realization I think a lot of students wonder when when is it that we actually um, make the decision to, to do something lifelong and I think you are right at the point that so many students at this college are at and you definitely made a commitment for 45 years at that point and so maybe you could relay to us like how you did that and what it's meant since then. Mm. Thank you, Adam. Uh, the film is really the fruit of a passion and I think if you have a passion for something and you channel that passion into something, then you've got a great chance of bearing fruit from it. So for me, filming was a way of embodying what I loved doing into something that I wanted to tell people about eventually. And back in the, the late 60s, early 70s, there was a strong consciousness about the way we were modifying the environment. And there were signals there which would perhaps hint at how the world might be changing in the future. And so the idea with this film, when I started filming it at the age of 17, was to focus on things which I thought were going to be affected by change in the environmental aspect. But then again, there was also a lot of innovation going on there in exciting areas in sports and extreme sports. So, and that's what I was involved in. So I combined the two. I was focusing on the innovators of those sports at the time, but at the same time, observing and filming the environment that they were recreating in. Because the intention was eventually, as you see in the film, was to actually teach through the journey, exciting journey of evolution of adventure sports, the environmental aspects. So what I tried to do right from the beginning was uh, superimpose the, the lessons, if you like, on a fun journey, an exciting mm -hmm. journey, and teach subliminally, if you like. So it's to excite people about 
learning. And, and the film, I think, I see it as a, a great opener for people on the subject of environmentalism and science who not necessarily are already interested in that. And I think that uh, by, using, by using the fun and the sports and the, the innovations therein, it's been a great platform to do that. Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the, the great powers of that film was that when I'm teaching the class that I teach, I have a number of students that aren't quite sure what it means to, to work in the environment and to possibly how they might actually get involved with it. And this was a, a very creative way of actually showing that this is one of the things that we actually take from the environment is this great love of of, in your case, it was adrenaline type sports, but actually using the power of nature to, to create enjoyment, to, to have a lot of fun with it, whether it be surfing or snowboarding or hang gliding or even bungee jumping where, you know, gravity, what a wonderful thing. And then it was one of those ways to actually see how the environment, what's going on in the environment is actually impacting these lifestyles. And so these things that students love, especially uh, appropriate in a place like Santa Barbara and other coastal communities where you know a lot of students are going to be surfing to see how that um, see that interplay. Um, one of the things I, I was it, it's very quite clear in this film and it's never actually mentioned um, directly but it's the concept of shifting baselines and it, that's a term that was coined in I guess in 1995 but it was kind of basically the concept of what we see as healthy is changes each generation because we often have lost the memory of what a truly healthy environment once looked like and a film like yours actually captures that it actually shows what the environment was like it actually shows what some of these coastal communities looked like um, and your travels around the world that you show in the film so well um, the the difficulty of getting back to those places and, and seeing it um, changed so dramatically from when it was first visited may have been lost had we uh, only left it to memory but you captured it in film was that uh, you know was the concept of shifting baselines really intentional at that point and and at the same time what would you really be doing now like what might be some advice to students of film or the environment given what you've captured in this film what, where they might go to help um, document this type of this type of change. Hmm. It's interesting you talk of shifting baselines. That kind of concept did not come out until I had actually, I was well into the, the process of creating the film. And then I realized that what we were seeing then in the 60s as kids, what we were born into, we accepted as the norm. It was only when we became adults and saw the significance of that, we realized that what we had accepted as normal was not normal. And an example there is when these uh, very young kids are, are playing in the mud, the deforestation mud, mm -hmm. which we thought was quite natural. Mm -hmm. and it was only w when we became adults and became educated about it, we realized that was actually a, a tragedy. Mm -hmm. But that was a piece of incidental footage which exemplified that. And it was in making the film that I realized that there were many aspects and angles um, and revelations in our footage mm -hmm. which could be used to demonstrate that and so uh, my advice to filmmakers is that uh, film around the things that interest you if you have a core a line of interest and an eventual intent about something then do film it I mean these days you can do it mm -hmm. because it's, res it's reasonably cheap to mm -hmm. actually film in electronic form whereas back then we, it was very expensive of course to do that mm -hmm. Um, but the objective in Last Paradise film was to show experientially and evidentially and incidentally um, that shifting baseline. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that really came out in it. And so what we see today, the world we see today, is not like the world we were born into. Mm -hmm. But then the world we were born into then was not like the world our parents were born into and so on and so on. And that shifting baseline is something that we're responsible for and we can modify or we can turn it back the other way mm -hmm. as you see towards the end of the film. That actually it's that individualized uh, innovation mm -hmm. that we can develop to steer things back the other way. There's potential for every person to develop that innovative spirit, which was very alive back then, mm -hmm. and turn it into recreating 
a different world, uh, repairing the natural environment and actually shifting the baseline down to back to something mm -hmm. uh, which uh, originally was and naturally should be. And I think that, that was one of the, the great components of that was that students now, you know, that are just um, becoming conscious, if you will, of what's going on around them. And oftentimes that, that happens during the teenage years is that they start to realize the world that's around them. They don't realize what it might have been 40 or 50 years ago, and they don't, they don't mm -hmm. see that, that change. And I think that's what's been great about this film. I think that's what so many people were able to take away from that. Even those that lived during that time period, they, they found themselves recollecting back and re remembering, wow, it really was different. And uh, our memory fades over, over the years, or it's, it starts to get affected by what's cur currently happening. But the students of today, the ones that are you know, in their teenage years watching that film, realize, wow, that there really has been a major shift. And I know we, we spoke briefly about that before the, the showing of the film and the challenge that you face and that you basically have kind of these two audiences. You have one audience that will see this as a uh, kind of a trip down memory lane, if you will, um, kind of recollecting the, the, the beautiful times of the 60s and, and will recall their childhoods and, and possibly the, the lower levels of development and pollution um, in, in areas where they might have grown up. But there's a great challenge to the students that are young now looking back and, and you, you try to guard against that feeling of loss, that, oh, we've lost this and uh, we may never be able to regain it. And so can maybe say a little bit more about the efforts of what, what you and, and this kind of group of friends that you, you had during the making of this film have done to change that mentality that it's not lost, there's something you can do about it. Right, yeah. The tone we tried to establish with the film, Last Paradise, was not to lament about where the change is, but I guess to impassion the audience in how the world used to be, mm -hmm. so that experientially, it was always filmed in an experiential way, from the perspective of uh, the audience, as if the audience was living the journey. Mm -hmm. It's not that we lived this journey, this is how it was, it's you are taken on this journey right from the word go, from mm -hmm. the opening scene. So you walk through the world in the 1950s, 1960s, and you become familiar with the way it was originally, but you also become quite impassioned about it. You fall in love with the way the world was then. And so there's awareness, but there's also a, a want to take it back there, if you like. So the new generation, the, the generation today, can, and us too, can be reminded about how it was and they mm -hmm. can learn how it was. So we've at least got a direction and, and a knowledge of how it should be. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the enlightenment or the education or the inspiration is subliminal. Mm -hmm. So rather than explaining uh, how it was, we just subliminally allow them to feel and experience how it was. And that's the objective in using original footage mm -hmm. and always having filmed that footage in a way that takes the audience to experience it rather than hear about it or mm -hmm. observe it from the outside. That was the prime objective, was to, to have them, I suppose, become familiar and impassioned by the original state, the original mm -hmm. baseline. So that it does bring up a pretty, a, a question, and that, that question is, is you probably had hours upon hours of footage over 45 years and listening to you describe how difficult it was to get some of that early footage where it was taking an hour and a half to load the camera just to go out and get 30 seconds of a shot um, which it'd be great to have you to say a few words about but when you got into the to the editing room to actually make this film what was your process in actually choosing what got into the film and what didn't because I would have to imagine cutting out some of the shots mm. would have been like, you know, basically taking hours upon hours of your life and saying, OK, that didn't make the cut. Mm. And probably remembering all of the all of the issues, all the challenges of getting that one particular shot. Mm. But that was one that didn't make it in the film. And so yeah. I think it'd be an interesting thing, especially for filmmakers to hear. Um, no, number to one, one yeah. number one determinant in making this film was a powerful storyline. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of films, particularly in sports, don't perhaps focus. Mm. So we were trying to do something perhaps that was a little bit different in that respect, was to produce a very strong storyline that was not only educational but very entertaining and it flowed. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, there are many disparate themes in this movie, mm -hmm. all the way from kids playing mm -hmm. to, um, to some very 
powerful physics, I suppose, mm -hmm. and scientific angles mm -hmm. that spring out of uh, an adventure in the Tasman Glacier. Mm -hmm. you know. So the script, the story was number one. Mm -hmm. So admittedly, there was some great footage that really had to end up on the cutting room floor that mm -hmm. we couldn't use and always had intended to use, mm -hmm. but it did not tell the story. Mm. But because we had a lot of footage, we were usually able to to be able to capitalize on, on the good footage and still keep the storyline going. Excellent. So, and, and you, you do bring in a, a, a powerful component of the science in this. Your background is as a forensic engineer, as a physicist. Um, you know, your work with some of the best physicists in New Zealand who basically got you guys into this mindset of let's apply some of these scientific principles to one, a better understanding of the environment in which you're enjoying, but uh, eventually it led to the development of a number of, of um, systems that evolved into really the data collection that we now depend on to better understand things like climate change. And it's, it's an inroad for students to see the power of science in this field in that you can be this adventure, traveler, extreme sports enthusiast and at the same time, you can be a powerful scientist and actually being doing, be doing something that helps you better understand that environment that you enjoy so much and actually protect it. Now, you came about it from the standpoint of a physicist, and that's, that's quite strong in the film, not only from your development of the data collection systems, but also your, your mention of uh, fusion energy technology as a, as a potential um, source of, of, a more, of a cleaner energy source that we can make use of instead of fossil fuels. There's a number of other students out there that may not, well, one, I would ask, you know, what would you advise students that, that may be in physics or, or might be interested in that type of field? But in your travels and in your work with these other people, um, how else have you seen the possibility of students getting an inroad into the science, even if maybe physics isn't their strong, strong suit? Mm. Well, for me personally, uh, having studied science gave me a, a a fascinating perspective on absolutely everything in life. I saw physics as being uh, underpinning many other sciences, perhaps chemistry for example, mm -hmm. and the tool of physics is mathematics. Mm -hmm. So physics is not just a narrow field, it actually does explain a lot about mm -hmm. the, um, the chemical and even the biological universe. Mm -hmm. So it also springboards into that and geology and so on. So for me physics was a fundamental beginning and then it went on into pure physics. I would say that for, for almost any student, whatever you're going to end up specializing in, it's a really great start. Mm -hmm. But not just in your career, because if you can imagine the physics playing out in everyday life and always ask that question about the mathematics, what is the mathematics saying? That intrigue and that entertainment that it gives you and that perspective it gives you on everyday life Mm -hmm. is what keeps the fire burning, both in learning the physics and in enjoying everyday life mm -hmm. and solving everyday problems. And so I think the combination of living life and studying science is a, is a fantastic way to live. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, sometimes we, we call it, it's giving you a lens with which to look at the world. And I think that's what mm -hmm. um, I appreciated greatly about your film is you actually provided several lenses with which people could view the world. They could view the world from the, the standpoint of the science involved, but also from the standpoint of, of how we are so intimately interacting with our environment. And then mm -hmm. if we actually looked at, looked at the world in that regard, we start to see um, some of the, the mistakes we're making and possibly as a result um, putting them in, in, in better light so that we can, we can find solutions. Um, just move it. Sun's just oh, just got you. Eyes, okay, yeah. that's good. I can shift okay. actually. Oh. This will be a no, no, sweet. editing I'll break. Back. I'll just come <laughs> back further. Is that all right. Yeah. It's okay, Logan. Um, I didn't. Let's see. I'm. I think I'm okay now. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we're yeah, probably. We're, we're having a couple minutes long. Yeah. yeah. And as long as it doesn't affect your focus too much. Yeah, no, I think we're probably good. Um, okay. Okay, and I'll. Oh, that's fine. Um. You got a time of that, have you? In terms of the uh, in terms of the tape length there, or in terms of your I, time? I'm length? okay because I actually pushed my lab back to about 11:30 because yeah. we're doing a film in that in that class as okay. well. Okay, we should be gone by yeah by 10:2, but I think we're still okay. okay for a little while. That's fine. Yeah. 
Um, so some of the things that you talked about in the film were um, associated with, uh, with energy, with this fusion energy technology. I know you've been involved with that at various levels and people you're working with involved with that at various levels. It's not talked about as much in the U.S. Um, we're highly dependent on fission energy. Um, what's the current state? I mean, what are, what are you guys, are people still working on it? Are you still interacting with these people working on it? I'm going to actually have to stop because I'm about to lose this chair. <laughs> I'm slowly falling into the mulch. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, uh, I just started you're sinking. Your level. Yeah. I'm losing my level. Yeah. There we go. Sorry, Logan. Mm. Okay. See there. I was about to go over backwards. Just so really put a key uh, question was the last one, wasn't it? Yeah. So the really the key question is is where's where's that science now, and and are you still uh, working with it actively? Um, are you working with the people that are working with it actively? Uh, it's be kind of a nice follow up to the film in that you see this research going on with the with the Tokamak and the uh, the ITER project, and it'd be interesting to hear kind of what's been going on since then because I know it can advance quite quickly. Mm. The development of fusion energy has continued through the decades. One of the problems, of course, with uh, uh, finding money for things like fusion development, which are not going to bring about a yield mm -hmm. uh, until a few decades mm -hmm. henceforth, is that uh, a particular government is not likely to finance a project which is not going to bring about fruit in the term of office. Mm -hmm. that, that's always been a problem. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is problematic with, with the fusion energy is that because it is pioneering science and pioneering physics, there is a shortage, if you like, of, um, of people studying the physical sciences at the moment. That is a concern with those people who have been working in the fusion project. Mm. And they very much need and depend on a degree of excellence in science and physics to make the advancements that's required. Mm -hmm. Fusion energy has been in, progressed in the JET project, the GET, mm -hmm. the Joint European Taurus project mm -hmm. in the last decade. And that was headed most recently by Barry Green, who was the person that we mm -hmm. interviewed in the film. And now this, the sequel to that uh, is the ITER project, mm -hmm. which Barry talks about in the movie. Mm -hmm. And that is the project which is now being built mm -hmm. that is going to carry fusion forward mm -hmm. to a point where a prototype power plant can be built mm -hmm. and the first fusion energy can be generated and that's a project which involves 60 percent of the world's population mm -hmm. and um, is the current state of the art represents the state of the art in in fusion development now i was involved in both studying and research in fusion energy mm -hmm. in the 70s mm -hmm under Professor Lyley, who I studied with for six years, who was the innovator of fusion energy, mm -hmm. if you like, the tokamak. He built the first tokamak in the Western world. Um, the, for me, it was unfinished business. I felt the best thing I could do for fusion energy was to re-excite people about it mm -hmm. and to reach out to as many people I could Mm -hmm. be them politicians or potential students mm -hmm. and address that issue both of bringing money into it, uh, bringing attention to it and enthusing the next generation about fusion energy and the study of physics mm -hmm. as the road to progressing that. And film for me was the best way I could do that. So it was I suppose killing two birds with one stone to not only produce a film that was inspiring people in environmental restoration mm -hmm. but also to bring into that fold the fusion energy project which mm -hmm. I see as being part and parcel of that because mm -hmm. one of the things that is preventing us from perhaps following that agenda is addressing this energy issue mm -hmm. whereby if we're still using fossil fuels mm -hmm. to generate large-scale electricity mm -hmm. then uh, that in itself is a problem and fusion energy is the future in that area. Mm -hmm. One of the great challenges we're going to face as, as a global population is 80% of the world's population is in developing countries. Uh, they're in desperate need of, of energy sources in order to improve their economy and well-being, yet they tend to also have uh, less infrastructure, less money in order to start a, a large-scale uh, program of energy. And I would imagine fusion technology like fission energy 
requires a substantial input of cash in order to make it work. And so I was just wondering, uh, what's your understanding of where they're going with this? Is it going to be primarily targeted towards developed countries, or is there some sort of effort being made to um, really make it possible for these this type of energy technology in the developing world? Mm. Well, it's an intentional thing uh, that the fusion project at the moment, ITER, has involved 60% of the world's population. And by that, I mean the major developing countries. So as well as the US, there's uh, China and India are involved, and of course Japan and so on. And so this is not a project which has been led or isolated to one country. There are many countries involved in it. And the intention is to actually to, to use the contributions in terms of scientific power from those countries, uh, but also to, to make sure that they're brought into the fold of um, mm -hmm. the fusion de development. Mm -hmm. Great. And you said you might have a, a question coming my way yeah, for, yeah. for something associated with the film. Yeah. Okay. Well, it has been a great privilege, and thanks very much, to be able mm -hmm. to screen the film at the Arlington, mm -hmm. hosted by the Centre of Sustainability of the uh, City College here at Santa mm -hmm. Barbara. And I'd just like to ask you, Adam, um, how you think this film is perhaps useful as an educational tool mm -hmm. in, in sciences or in your own work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's it's a it's a great film to get kind of a general audience, especially students who aren't quite yet sure where they might be going with something. Um, get them involved, get them hooked. And I think the I think that concept of a of a hook in a in a film is very uh, appropriate here. In the same sort of sense that students are struggling with what's going on in the world, I think they have a sense, they have an understanding that there's something not right, and that if something doesn't change significantly and soon, they're not necessarily going to have the same opportunities that their parents or their grandparents had. Um, you know, I'm a, a parent myself and I see that, that worry that as my child grows older, will, will she be able to see some of the things that I've seen? And yet they still struggle as to what exactly do they do about it? And, you know, how is it that they can become involved with it? And so what's, what I really uh, appreciated about the way you did the film is you took the concept of first and foremost, understand the environment, enjoy it, be a part of it. Uh, if you isolate yourself from it, if you're sitting at home behind a, a video screen playing video games or on Facebook, you, you've lost that connection. And that, that kind of disease of disconnect is something that, that has been so prevalent. And so really first and foremost, I think the film just screams out, get out there, enjoy it, spend time in the, in the, in the world. And, and then the other side of it was that uh, clear love of science and that as this this great inroad into not only doing something about the environment but also um, understanding it better so I think it's it's got a great power to do that um, I think there's a lot of uh, possibilities to market this to colleges and universities because it's it's very appropriate for this kind of intergenerational discussion that um, one of the things we try to do is to bring in community members who may have had a more experience with this shifting baseline and then bring them together with students so that they have both the historical context and uh, this kind of energy of, of the student population. And then I think a, another possibility would actually to be to build um, a website around the film so that students can pursue more information associated with this. They could get into the research on fusion energy. They could look at what's going on with ecological restoration. Uh, they can find out um, how they might be able to transition some of their passions into something that actually uh, provides a, a benefit to, to the environmental systems. And, you know, I think of the partnerships we've developed here at City College working with uh, people that, that are working in restoration, people that are working in permaculture, uh, people that are working in kind of eco-city design. All of those would be great resources for students and to use your film as kind of the initiation, the here's, here's a way to get a, a big audience in front, sitting, listening, seeing what's going on in the world, and then to follow that up with um, something that they can take it another step further and find out this is some great work that's being done out there, how might I actually do that here? What's going on in my own backyard? Uh, what's going on at my own college or my own university? Um, some way for them to pursue that extra information. and. I think that that's uh, worked with some 
some uh, good films and some good um, kind of internet, if you will, educational materials. But it, it, your film, I think, lends itself very well to that because uh, it clearly is going to pull people into it and pull people from a, a very diverse uh, background, very diverse set of populations. And you, once you've got them hooked, to be able to give them that one next step of like, now that you're interested in this whole fusion idea, here's here's some websites on the ITER, here's some websites on the Tokamak, here's some um, aspects on, on reef ecology and restoration, if you want to be involved with that. And I think that's something where you have students that, and I see this all the time with, with mine, you never know what's going to get them. You never know what's going to be the thing that they actually turns their life around, yeah. really. And your film has that ability to do that. You know, students seeing a film like that, I think a number of them will, that, that will be the lightning strike that actually creates the epiphany of, I know what I want to do now. And they're going to be so wide open and so so demanding, really, for more information and where to go from there uh, to be able to fill that. And I think that's real, one of the real benefits of, of your film for, for an audience, especially in the, in the educational realm, is that one of the things that, that faculty members struggle with is we can provide all the data and we can talk about the issues out there, but what's the thing that's really going to hook the student to motivate them to actually want to take this on for the rest of their life? And, and that's what I think your film does beautifully. Yes. And that, that was the intention in creating Last Paradise film, was to actually to create something that fired the students up, that created in them a passion, and that would be a seed. And that's, that's where it all begins, mm -hmm. is that seed and that excitement about science and connecting it to your, the real world and to your life and your future. Mm. And uh, I think that, that was very gratifying to see young people come out of the mm. audience and feel excited about mm. that, because that is the beginning Mm -hmm. of the rest of their lives. And, and, I, and I think it would be a mistake to think that this film should cover every aspect of renewable energy or every aspect of restoration, because no film could. Mm -hmm. And I think if people instead saw it in that way, they'd realize that this is, this is the trigger. And once you pull the trigger, now it's up to that student or a teacher or a community to then just channel that energy and use that energy. and. That was the other thing that I think was, was really interesting to me in that film. We, there was a, a talk about the environment and talk about energy, and yet probably the most powerful aspect of the energy in that film was the energy of the people that cared about what was going on and wanted to, in many cases, just get to the surf. Uh, in other cases, it was seeing the degradation going on around them and to do something about that. And that's, that's, a, that's a renewable energy supply that I think we actually uh, could make much better use of. And I think uh, you might say that, that um, this film is, is one of the, the fuels for that energy supply. And I think if, if people saw it in that way, I, I think they'd, they'd be able to run with it in mm. just about any direction. Yeah, we have so many resources in the world today to learn. Uh, but what is most vital is the enthusiasm mm -hmm. and the passion to do that and yeah. drive forward. And that's where the results will come from in the future. And we will be uh, developing our website mm -hmm. further to, to include pages and leads to educational mm -hmm. uh, information that's related to the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, subsequently we also will be producing DVD versions for education mm -hmm. whereby they'll include a lesson plan. Mm -hmm. Because this film was built on a lesson plan. Mm -hmm. The skeleton of this, of Last Paradise film, was a very, very intense lesson plan. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite a challenge to actually break that down to something which is just fun and mm -hmm. flowed. So the more you watch the film, the more you'll uncover these layers. Mm -hmm. And so it'll actually be quite an easy process to take the backbone out of it mm -hmm. and expose that as a lesson plan. And that mm -hmm. will happen in DVD form and later on the website, which is www.lastparadisefilm. So you follow that website and you'll be able to follow its screenings, hopefully more in the US mm -hmm. and uh, Australia and New Zealand. Great. And Europe, we'll of course go to Europe next year, but we've got the rest of our lives to, to get this out there. Yeah. <laughs> We had the other half of our lives to film it. Yeah. The rest of our lives to get it out there. <laughs> and it's a, it's such a timely film. And I, I think if I was to to advise or give advice to to other educators, it would be to to really look for films like this. I mean, this is the kind of thing that makes our job a bit easier, because you know we can stand up in front of a classroom and and try to motivate students. But oftentimes, what you need is that little extra something. And this film, I think, really provides that in spades, is that you really have the opportunity to pull students in 
and and really motivate them and inspire them. And the the beauty of that is, we could you can do it at just about any level. I mean, I'd imagine students in junior high or high school watching that film and getting excited about science. I can imagine students in the college level who are struggling to find what they want to do with their career seeing that film and and really you know taking that on. But one of the things that we see in community colleges too are a lot of returning students, students that have been in careers, have been in the job uh, market, maybe have, have remember a similar time that the film is covering and r realize after seeing a film like that how much has changed. And it's a motivation to shift uh, pathways from maybe a, a career that they had that wasn't giving to them and giving to the environment the way that they had hoped and to, to transition into something different. And so, you know, I, I would say that, you know, I would recommend this film and, and really doing this type of um, showing of a film like this to, to any college or university. I think it'd be a, an excellent opportunity for students in a community to really see this. One of the key things I, I see, at, at particularly at the beginning of semesters, is that uh, students are not necessarily geared up to connect what they're learning with, what they're learning about, sorry, mm -hmm. with the world they're living in. Mm -hmm. and if they can become enthused right at the beginning of the semester mm -hmm. and they can see what they're about to learn mm -hmm. with excitement and its significance played out in the real world as we try to do in mm -hmm. Last Paradise film and actually connect it to an exciting journey, then that just gives them that, um, that enthusiasm mm -hmm. uh, and significance of what they're going to learn right through the semester. So do you think at the beginning of the semester is a good time to show a film like this? I, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities there. I think you, could, you can show it at the beginning and get that motivation going. I think it's also a, a, a useful film really at any point in time because the, the benefit of it is, is you, don't, you don't try to tell every aspect of the story. You know, you tell a story and with that story you can come into it, you can connect to it in a lot of different ways. So it could also be almost a culminating experience at the end of a semester at the same time because students will have learned all of the information now about the environmental challenges. They'll then see it and they'll see a whole potentially different way of looking at it. And so I think the, the benefit of it is, is it's flexible. And um, it's, I could see using it basically at any point. And, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, put it in too, too tight a category in that regard. Because I think uh, a teacher, um, if, if they know what they're doing and, and I have great confidence in my colleagues, will see the benefit of something like this and f find an inroad to it at just about any point. Um, so I, th I think that's uh, some of the, you know, many of the students that attended that, that film, um, some were from environmental studies, but we had students in there from, from English. There were students in there from other sciences, political science. I mean, I, I encouraged faculty to send their students of all different disciplines to this film because you, you can do an entire project just off under, watching this film and, and maybe writing a, a response to it or, or doing a research into one of the aspects of it. So it really does lend itself to um, motivate students to, to look into something that they might not otherwise have looked into. And in, in this community, especially like Santa Barbara, um, you've got a lot of students that enjoy the natural environment. They're out, they're surfing, they're hiking, they're hang gliding. They're doing many of the same things that you show in that film. And to show them that they have such a place in, in the, that part of the world is uh, a real powerful thing. Because they're often, uh, many of them might be students that just don't feel like they really belong there yet. They, they don't consider themselves scientists maybe. But now they see how they can become scientists. There's, there's no reason they couldn't. And, uh, at the same time, they see this group of people that have been so successful uh, and enjoyed life to such an extent as you and your, your friends had, had enjoyed it, and yet are giving back in such a major way. I think that's, that's a real powerful thing for them. I think that um, what you said there was probably the, uh, was the concluding note of the film, wasn't it? In that the, the ambassadors or the saviors of tomorrow's wilderness are the kids that play in it today. Mm -hmm. And we can see now how kids are less inclined to play outside and mm -hmm. the implication of that for the future. And it is true, and mm -hmm. you see in the film it played out, that uh, when children play outside, they form a relationship with the environment, inclined to protect it when they're older, but they also are inclined to study the physical sciences, mm -hmm. which in turn flow back into the saving of the wilderness. It empowers them to do that. Yeah. And it actually does help to create that and stimulate that personal innovative spirit 
which is what we, we need to keep alive today. Mm -hmm. As you see in Last Paradise, it was the very thing that actually brought about the fruits of what the film showed. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, thanks very much, Adam, for yes. allowing us to showcase yep. and to, I suppose, uh, show the film really in an educational aspect mm -hmm. uh, to its first audience. Yeah, and a community and, college. And thanks so much for coming all the way to Santa Barbara and, and joining us here. And mm -hmm. and uh, I, I know that, that this college really benefited from that. This community really benefited from seeing that film. Um, and and I really hope to see you doing a, a California tour sometime soon and, mm -hmm. and, and really hitting uh, all the colleges and universities. I think they would benefit greatly from, from this film. I look forward to doing it.